The easy money's been made. Uh, you'll recall the first time you and I talked about uranium was probably 2022. The price was at 20 bucks. So is the price up or down? Uh, went from 20 to 110, yep. down to 80, back to 90. Whether it's up or down depends on your time frame, but certainly the easy money has been made. Oil price increased from, say, 1800 to 2200 uh, a nice move, a 20% move. It wasn't reflected in margins because the cost moved up too. But the reasons are much more fundamental than that. The gold stocks are hated. And I think the gold stocks are hated for reasons of the gold industry's own authorship. If then we were to reduce carbon production uh, rateably, taking into account past production and taking into account per capita current production, that would mean that the price of a kilowatt hour in the United States uh, of electricity, because we had to subsidize uh, consumers in other countries, would be 40 cents or 50 cents as opposed to 12 cents. In other words, we would have to eat our own cooking. If you explain that value proposition to U.S. taxpayers, the way it has been expressed through the market to German taxpayers, I think that the perception around fossil fuels would be very different than the perception that faces us today. But irrespective of perspective, it isn't your perception or mine that matters. It's the perception of the buyers. And the buyers who want to buy electricity are forced as a consequence of cost to buy coal. Hey guys, welcome to Capital Cosm. Today I have the one and only legendary Rick Rule on the show back on again for a third time. Rick, thanks for making the hat trick. Always a pleasure. I enjoy talking to your audience and I enjoy your questions. So thank you for having me back. Yeah, as always, guys, nothing in this video is financial advice. Neither Rick nor I are financial advisors. So please do your own due diligence. Rick, let's just kick it right off. What is your general view of the market at the moment? Are you talking about resource markets, equity markets? Which markets let's do you go mean? Ahead and talk, let's go ahead and get broad. Um, let's talk about macro for now. I know you're not a macro analyst, but just you, your opinion is always valuable to, to us. Uh, I'm uh, concerned a little bit. Uh, about the ebullience in markets. I'm concerned about the fact that people, at least the popular media, seems to assume that nothing can go wrong. I think things can go wrong. Uh, I'm nervous, too, uh, about the fact that I think the market is misinterpreting inflation, which is to say, I think the market's view of inflation is taken by the CPI. And I don't think the CPI is a good indicator of the deterioration of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. My fear and it's just a fear, is that we're the same place in the market that we were in, say, 1970. The specter of inflation was front of us all the way from 1967, but people weren't looking at it because they'd been through th two pretty good decades. It wasn't until about 1982 that the real impact of the deterioration of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar relative to the uh, interest rates that people were receiving on their deposits really hit home to them. Uh, and that caused a substantial equity market decline. It, it caused a real rout in the bond market, and it changed the way that people invest. My nervousness is that people believe that inflation is 2.7%, while I believe that the real deterioration of their purchasing power is closer to 7%, meaning that people who entrust money to a U.S. 10-year uh, treasury are, in effect, losing 3% compounded. I'm afraid that when that realization hits the market, that the bond market will get hit hit first and, and that there will be some pullover in equities markets. On the other hand, I am astonished at how well the U.S. economy has withstood higher nominal interest rates. I'm impressed by the continuing gains in productivity that America is getting from innovation. Uh, I'm impressed with the fact, put harshly, that our individual creativity is such that we can still afford our collective stupidity. The American business person seems to be able to outproduce the government's ability to consume, which is reflected in the broad economy. So I would say that my overall outlook is mixed. Uh, in the precious metal space, I'm pretty bullish. Uh, my experience has been that gold does well when uh, confidence in the maintenance of purchasing power in conventional fiat instruments remains strong. 
since I believe that the facts don't warrant confidence, uh, my belief is that other people will have cause to be nervous and that the precious metals will increase. I notice in particular that the gold price has increased without nervousness. It hasn't been individual buyers of gold. It's been central bank buyers of gold for a very different reason, the weaponization of the U.S. dollar that's caused the gold price to increase. If you add retail buying on top of central bank buying, you'll get a circumstance where the move that we've just seen in gold is insignificant. Think about the moves that we enjoyed in the period 2000 to 2010, a sevenfold move in the price of gold. Uh, that's what interests me, not a $50 move. And I'm attracted to across the range of industrial materials. Uh, certainly the increase in consumption around the world has increased uh, faster than our ability to produce it has. The caveat in that, of course, is that, uh, and I'm no economist, but I notice once every 10 years or once every 15 years, we conspire to have a pretty good recession. <laughs> and if we have a recession, the inevitability of supply shortages gets delayed. Uh, because of depressed demand during the recession. So uh, if your listener's economic reading uh, isn't as somber as mine, uh, I think that they can buy things like oil and gas and copper, uh, agricultural minerals, stuff like that with absolute impunity. Yeah. So you mentioned the 2 to 3% reported CPI rate, and you think it's more so along the lines of 7%. Is that, do you make that as, kind of assertion just based off of the old 1980s methodology that we used to calculate CPI, or do you just look at like the gold prices move then versus two, now? Two things, both much more empirical. I, I look at the uh, construction of the CPI. First of all, it's hedonistically adjusted, which means that they don't use real prices. They use prices that they assign values to. Right. Uh, which means that the price that you paid for the computer doesn't matter to them. It's how good a computer that you th they think it is relative to the computer you would have bought 10 years ago. The same thing for your house and your apartment. So uh, in, in the first instance, I, I think that the index is deliberately misleading. The second thing is when it's reported, it's reported as core inflation, which ex ex excludes food and fuel. If you look at me, I'm a rather portly old guy. So I like to eat, uh, I like to fly, I like to drive. And a cost of living index, which doesn't include food or fuel, is of really limited utility to me. But the third variable, the one that your listeners really need to pay attention to, is that the CPI as a cost of living index doesn't include tax. The largest expense in most households, larger than housing, larger than transportation, larger than energy, and larger than food combined, is tax. That is a really good point. I've never heard anyone make that point before. On the, on the uh, they, I don't think they want you to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, too, that the fastest growing component of my household expense is federal, state, and local tax, directly and indirectly. The fact that uh, an item which makes up 40% of many household budgets isn't included in the cost of living uh, maybe is explained away by the fact that nobody regards government as a good or a service. <laughs> so from that point of view, it isn't included in the index. But in terms of a measure of the cost of living, it has to be included in the index. Gotcha. So with this more inflationary outlook right now, is it is, is it to say that it's a, gold is acting as sort of a leading indicator for inflation, it, much the same way that it acted in 2020? It, it isn't yet. That's my point. Yeah. Gold hasn't moved because of retail buying as a consequence of fear of inflation. Gold has moved because of central bank buying. And the central bank buying has occurred because of the U.S. government's own policy with regards to the weaponization of the U.S. dollar. Confiscating $300 billion worth of Russian treasuries makes other governments, but particularly the Chinese, a little leery <laughs> of holding U.S. government securities. At the same time... Uh, the U.S.'s extraterritorial imposition of their might uh, through the SWIFT banking system has meant that countries increasingly whose policy goals are different than the policies of the United States feel nervous about transacting in U.S. dollars for fear that the U.S. government won't allow it. We're leaving these central banks no choice but to sell U.S. dollars and buy gold. 
the enemy of the U.S. dollar isn't Russia, it isn't China, it isn't India, it isn't Iran, it's Congress and the president. Uh, if you overlay uh, what I believe will be an increasing awareness of the deterioration of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar and the negative real rate of interest experienced by American savers, I think that you come to a realization of the type that we uh, last came upon in the decade of the 70s. And I think the impact of retail buying of gold and silver for fear purposes and government buying of gold and silver, gold in particular, because the U.S. government has given them no choice, uh, has the building blocks for a real bull market, not a bull market where the price moves from 2000 to 2200. Interesting. So is this what what about uh let's take it back to the 1930s in Weimar Germany in Weimar Germany you had obviously rapid inflation hyperinflation in their case but then you also had a booming stock market now we don't have hyperinflation by by definition but we do have a booming stock market regardless that you, that you just alluded to you know regardless of all of the you know inflationary aspects etc is What's going on here, the fact that people are just piling into assets that can't get inflated away? Well, certainly there's a lot of – I mean, first of all, there's a lot of stuff to buy. Uh, the Magnificent Seven, while I don't know what they're worth because I'm not a technology guy, uh, enjoy very rapid growth, great margins, and global dominance. They're great companies. Are they as great as the market thinks they are? I don't know. That's not what I do. What I do know is that there's $6 trillion in money market funds <laughs> and in deposit in the United States. There's a lot of cash on the sideline. And this combination of uh, an economy that is performing better than most people, myself included, thought it would with a doubling of nominal interest rates uh, and this liquidity and a relatively accommodative Fed policy means that you have very strong equity. There's a lot of money looking for a home. There's a lot of money for whom 4.1% is insufficient uh, relative to the opportunities that they've come to expect over four very benign uh, decades in investment climate. Remember, the people's expectation of the future is set by their experience in the immediate past. And our experience in the immediate past, going all the way back to 1982, has been pretty damn good. Uh, Yes, we've had some punctuations, 2008 being a great punctuation, if you will. Uh, we had a brief punctuation around COVID. But the truth is that the lesson that was lessons that were learned then was that the Fed has your back by the dip. So our expectation of the future is set by our experience in the immediate past rather than experience set by history. We had another period coming off uh, two decades of pretty benign economic progress, those periods being the 50s and the 60s. The early part of the decade of the 70s, uh, we had to atone for past sins. We, as a consequence of the war on gun, uh, guns and butter, uh, had either to increase taxes greatly or reduce benefits greatly. Since the taxpayer was willing to do neither, what we did was engineer the 80% depreciation of the U.S. dollar over 10 years in the decade of the 1970s. Uh there were two immediate cons well, three immediate consequences of that. The demolition of the long bond market <laughs> uh, due to higher interest rates, uh, a period where equity prices in the period 1968 to 1982 went nowhere. In other words, a 14-year lost period in equities. And of course, the explosion in precious metals and natural resources prices. I'm not saying that we have a return to the 1970s in the card, in the cards, but I think the lessons around excess liquidity, uh, around exploding government debt, uh, around negative real rather than nominal interest rates, in the face of very strong liquidity, means that there are parallels that are worth considering. Gotcha, gotcha. So, on the mining front, however, we we, we do see these. Precious metals starting to rise up, but the miners yep. have kind of lagged behind. Why have the miners lagged behind the metals? And is <laughs> aside from is it just the input cost? Is, it, is there something more to the, more more to the story here? Uh, what, do you, uh, I, what do you got to say? I love that question because we're going to make your audience sick. Uh, 
Uh, you alluded to the last reason, uh, which is to say that, yes, the gold price has moved up, but the input costs in producing gold have moved up too, in particular tax and royalty, uh, but also energy, uh, labor costs, uh, cement and steel. So at the same time that the price has moved up, the costs have moved up too. And when the gold the gold price increased from, say, 1800 to 2200 uh, a nice move, a 20% move, it wasn't reflected in margins because the cost moved up too. But the reasons are much more fundamental than that. The gold stocks are hated. And I think the gold stocks are hated for reasons of the gold industry's own authorship. I take you back to the period uh, 2000 to 2010, where the gold price increased from about 250 US dollars to about 1900 US dollars, a more than sevenfold increase in the gold price. The free cash flow of the XAU per share declined in that decade. Now, it took real skill on the part of management teams to generate declining cash flow per share when you produce economy, uh, a commodity that increased in price sevenfold. Are, are you sure they weren't government workers? <laughs> they were much more efficient at destroying an industry than the government could be. I, I think that goes back really to the investors. Uh, like Pogo said, I have met the enemy and he has us. And the reason I think that is I think investors' perceptions were set in the 1970s. What we, what paid us in the 1970s was simply leverage to the gold price. And ironically, the least efficient producers, the highest cost producers, enjoy the greatest uh, margin expansion in an increased commodity price. So investors began to look for the industry for leverage, which is a different way of saying they asked the industry to become marginal. And boy, did the industry become marginal uh, to the extent that, as I say, they diminished free cash flow per share when the commodity price increased sevenfold. I think now we have a circumstance where investors are asking the management teams to do something very different, which is to say become good businesses. And my suspicion is that as this bull market continues, what you're going to see for at least two or three years is exploding margins. And the consequence of that is that you're going to see some legitimacy back into the gold shares. If you take that down to the juniors, the example gets more extreme. If you merge every junior mining company on the planet, all the Aussies, all the Brits, all the Americans, all the Canadians, all that stuff into one company, we'll call it Junior Explore Co. just for laughs. That company in a very good year loses $2 billion. In a bad year, it loses $10 billion. So how much do you pay for that company? Do you pay eight times losses, 12 times losses? In a bull market, do you pay 20 times losses? The point is, what is that industry worth? And the answer to that is zero. So the market capitalizations of some of the constituencies are beginning to approach their worth, which is to say zero. The good news that's caught in that rather harsh fact is that perhaps 5% of the junior listings worldwide generate so much performance, so much utility, so much wealth that they add legitimacy and occasionally luster to a sector that loses on a good year $2 billion. The takeaway from this, and it's absolutely positively a takeaway, if you invest in the sector, you will go broke. If you invest in individual companies, you can do very, very well. That's the rub. Uh, in the XAU, if there's 38 companies, there are probably five or six worth buying. If you buy that five or six, you may give up 15% of the upside as the marginal companies outperform in a bull market. But you take away 85% of the downside. <laughs> And I believe if you take away 15% of the upside in return for <laughs> getting rid of 85% of the downside, you got a hell of a trade, uh, a hell of a trade. The same thing happens in the junior market. You have to be able to segregate in movie parlance between the good, the bad, and the ugly. If you do that, you experience the occasional 10-bagger, the occasional 15-bagger, the occasional 20-bagger. And believe me, a 20-for-1 return amortizes a whole bunch of 20 or 25 percent losers and leaves plenty of room left over to compensate you for the work that you've put in. But you have to do the work. Yeah. So there's many stages when it comes to figuring figuring out the, the right mining company to invest in. Last time we, we had you on, Rick, we talked about the Lausanne curve. This time I yep. want to get I want to talk about something different, though. I want, I want to talk about the prospect generator model. Can you walk us through exactly what that is? Sure. 
uh, the prospect generators are companies that realize the reality of exploration. Most people would have you believe that exploration is an asset intensive business, but you learn in geology school that one in 3000 <laughs> mineralized anomalies becomes a mine, which is to say that most of these projects are actually excuses to spend money with no possibility of reward. In other words, many of the assets they talk about are liabilities. The exploration process is really best looked at as a technology business where a skilled group of geoscientists look at a piece of property, develop a thesis uh, based on evidence, propose a measure to test that thesis, and answer a series of unanswered questions. When you look at an exploration business, you need to look at it the same way that you would a software business or a biotech business. You need to think about answering unanswered questions about the commercial viability of the thesis. That's what it's all about. What the prospect generator does is take that to its logical conclusion. Most junior mining companies take one property, they drill it on their own account, uh, and they try and experience success, thinking that if they enjoy success, that they'll get a 10 to 1 or 15 to 1 return. The arithmetic behind that is stupid. You're taking a 1 in 3,000 chance for a 10 to 1 return. This makes the California lottery look like a really good deal. Uh, by contrast, the prospect generator understands the business for what it is. They use specific skills uh, and assemble a multiplicity of uh, projects. They develop thesis, theses for them based not on what's hot in the market, but rather on science. And then they farm out the idea to other mining companies who contribute the capital cost to test the thesis. We talked about lotteries earlier. A prospect generator is about investing in the process by which you get a whole sack full of partial lottery tickets, 30% of a ticket, where the person who has the 70% of the ticket paid for the whole ticket. You're looking for a series of carried interests. You're also looking, too, for the customer, uh, the company that you joint venture with, to do a bunch of the due diligence. Let's say I was interested in a project, a prospect that was in a junior company, and I hired a consultant to look at it for me. That consultant, first of all, would try to figure out what I wanted to hear in the report, so I would hire him or her again. It <laughs> wouldn't necessarily be their whole opinion. And they'd charge me something between five and $10,000 to generate the report. If, by contrast, uh, a major mining company is interested in earning into the project, uh, they might spend a million dollars on due diligence and they wouldn't bill me anything. I love it when a prospect generator I own farms out a project to Newmont. And I know that Newmont's 300 geoscientists will be applying their collective knowledge to that project at no cost to me. In fact, Newmont will be paying for the privilege of doing my due diligence. <laughs> you can hear I'm all about arithmetic, really. So let me give you the underlying arithmetic. We learned already that one in 3,000 mineralized anomalies becomes a mine. So the headline number is that you have a one in 3,000 chance for success. There are lots of things that you can do to mitigate the odds. High quality people, wait for a discovery drill hole, lots and lots and lots of stuff. But the headline number for grassroots exploration is one in 3,000. I've invested in something like, and I don't know the exact number, 70 prospect generators in 45 years in the business, I've now participated in 24 economic discoveries. So rather than 3,000, I'm a 24 out of 70, something like 30%. A couple standard deviations higher expectation of success than I would have in conventional exploration. The arithmetic is crystal clear. Too many people invest in speculation with visions of sugar plums. What would happen if I got lucky, ignoring what the probability of getting lucky is? A second statistic, too, that is absolutely stark. We had a, uh, uh, an intern, <laughs> that's financial speak for slave, uh, 20 years ago, a uh, very bright young guy. And I asked him to pull 25 exploration companies, public exploration companies at random from the bowels of the then VSE. Uh, and look at five years of quarterly financial statements, uh, both balance sheet and income statement, and tell me the most prominent positive and negative trend. 
He asked me what I was looking for. I didn't tell him because I didn't want to prejudice the outcome. And besides which, I didn't know what I was looking for. I just wanted to see the way this young man thought. He called me back in two weeks and said, well, I couldn't find the positive trend you were looking for, frankly. But the negative trend was really obvious. I said, oh, yeah, what's that? He said, uh, of the 25 companies I polled, the median company spent over 60% of capital raised on G&A, general and administrative expense. Reducing your general and administrative expense around exploration to zero <laughs> by having another company uh, perform it for you uh, is obviously a, a, an advantage. We find uh, prospect generating companies spend be between a million and a million and a half dollars a year administering their generating program and then also administering the oversight of the exploration done on their behalf. Those companies that are spending a million or a million and a half dollars in GNA are routinely enjoying 25 to 30 million dollars a year being spent on their behalf by their counterparties. Again, it's all arithmetic. You take the GNA spend from 65% down to 7%, you can expect arithmetically a materially better outcome. Yeah. So do you get, invest in these uh, prospect generator models privately? Is that is that how... how uh, in the oil and gas side, I do it privately. In the yeah. mining side, I do it publicly. Okay, great. I, I know you have your uh, Rick Rule boot camp coming up on April 20th. You guys are going to go over this, this uh, prospect generator model. Uh, what are some of the topics that you're going to lay out in that boot camp? Well, importantly, we're going to lay out the difference between prospect generator and sole risk exploration, which is stark, but most people don't know about. Then we're going to talk about how to analyze a prospect generation company, uh, something called synthetic profit and synthetic revenue. The difference between the value of the third party expenditure made on the issuer relative to the money that the issuer itself had to spend to get that money spent, which uh, arithmetically is the best uh, financial model of the expectation of success. Our keynote speaker is going to be Dr. Steve Enders, who uh, was both the Dean of Geology at the Colorado School of Mines, which, other, which means he knows how to teach, and he certainly knows how to teach earth science, but he was also head of worldwide exploration for both Newmont and Phelps Dodge at different points in time in his career. He has been the chairman of Prospect Generators. Importantly, He's been the guy who negotiated joint ventures with prospect generators with two of the biggest mining companies on the world. And then also, uh, he's learned over three decades how to teach this stuff <laughs> to people like you and I. We're also going to have a wonderful young guy named Matt Geiger, who will become, uh, after I'm dead, uh, the best analyst around prospect generators in the world. He maintains a database of 70-something of them. Uh, and, and he's a superb young guy that almost nobody has ever heard of. And then, of course, we're going to have four real prospect generators uh, tell you why they're the greatest thing since sli sliced bread. But we're going to equip you with the tools to analyze whether what they say is or is not true. Yeah, so we'll have the link to that uh, boot camp down below. Click on that link. Register for it. You're always going to get value with Rick Roll. You know, no one else is talking about this, uh, the prospect generator model out there, at least that I'm aware of. So. I'm but listen, extremely I'll guarantee the, I'll guarantee the value. Uh, if you don't believe that you have received fair value for your tuition, email me. Gold-plated guarantee. I'll take the financial risk. I'll give you your money back. I can never give you the eight hours back that you're going to spend learning the material. But if you don't think that the money that I charge you for tuition, which is 99 US dollars, is worth it, Email me, absolute gold-plated money-back guarantee. There you go. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at these boot camps or just boot camps in general is that you're if you if you can't get a return on investment of nine on ninety-nine dollars, then you know there's something deeply wrong. And I, I I don't your boot camps are never like that, Rick. So right, yeah. So we've just, we've, we've had a money-back guarantee. We've had a money-back guarantee on information products for thirty years. And we've had to refund a little less than one-tenth of one percent of the tuitions that we've charged over 30 years. Because our content is very high quality, uh, the guarantee doesn't cost me much, but it's worth everything to the listener. Yeah. So link to that is down below. I want to take us to energy now. Uranium has been all over the place. It crashed down from $110 to 
$82 over the course of a month or so. Now it's back up to, I think, $87 last time I checked. So it's been bouncing around. What's your general prognosis on the uranium market at the moment? The easy money's been made. Uh, you'll recall the first time you and I talked about uranium was probably 2022. The price was at 20 bucks. So is the price up or down? Uh, went from 20 to 110, yep. down to 80, back to 90. Whether it's up or down depends on your time frame, but certainly the easy money has been made. In 2022, nobody wanted to own uranium stocks. But the price, the price of the stuff was 20 bucks a pound. It either had to go up or the lights were going to go out. You needed to decide if the price of uranium was going to go up to a level which would allow the industry to earn its cost of capital or whether the lights would go out. Those were the two choices. Nobody wanted to own uranium despite those facts. After the price ran to $100, after the price action had justified the narrative, everybody wanted to own it. <laughs> which is an interesting comment on human nature. Now let's look forward. And now it gets really interesting, but it gets really complex. Increasingly, the spot price of uranium, while it's what everybody refers to, doesn't matter much. The volumes in the spot market are very illiquid, so there's more price volatility than there ought to be. For one thing, my former employer, Sprott Inc., bought 50 million pounds. The volume on the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust on a daily basis is greater than the volume in the spot market, which is to say that the Sprott market is the spot market. And the spot market is an increasingly uh, illogical place to look for price information. Uranium sales and purchases are increasingly taking place on the term market rather than the spot market. The term market has a disadvantage of being opaque, which is to say that you and I can't see it or we can't see it easily. It has the advantage, though, uh, of being the first commodities market where producers and consumers can lock in specified periods of product at specified prices over specified periods of time. If you're a gold producer and you haven't sold a 15-year stream or you haven't engaged in a two-year forward sale, you have no idea what price you're going to re receive for your product. It's whatever the overnight, you know, whatever the spot price is. In the uranium business, uranium producers can lock in contracts with investment-grade counterparties that tell them, at least in terms of a floor price, price what they're going to receive for a given quantity of uranium 10 years from now. This means that creditors who are looking to lend money to build a uranium mine have price certainty, revenue certainty, and some margin certainty, which should lower the cost of capital for uranium construction relative to any other raw material. At the same time, equities analysts like myself, by nature stupid and lazy, uh, can rely on the contract market to understand with some degree of specificity, at least a greater degree of specificity than we enjoy with any other commodity, the selling price for the commodity with the company that we're advertising, uh, pardon me, analyzing five years out, 10 years out, or 15 years out. Over five years, my suspicion is that the companies who disclose their term markets well will enjoy a lower cost of capital, high share prices, and information around the term mar market will become much, much, much more prevalent in the market. And the consequence of that is that the uranium market will be the best understood and one of the markets with the highest rate of intelligent participation of any resource market on the planet. What that means in terms of a slogan is while the easy money has been made, the sure money is ahead of us. Uh, this is an opportunity unlike any I have ever seen in natural resources. My suspicion is that this pricing model will extend itself uh, into, at a minimum, the lithium market. But I don't think that that'll happen for five years. I think it's happening right before our eyes in the uranium market. And it's a really, really profound fact that nobody understands and nobody gives a damn about. Interesting. Let's go ahead and dig a little bit deeper on that, no pun intended. So how, how exactly is the uranium market tied into the lithium market, the way you're describing it? Isn't. It isn't. Uh, I just see a circumstance where the demand for lithium is increasing where because of the price explosion that we saw in lithium, billions of dollars went into lithium exploration, was successful. We found some. Now you need a way that battery producers can be guaranteed raw material. 
into the processing pipeline. You also need a way that the people who are looking to finance mines into production have some uh, way to maintain price stability. We've seen the price of the stuff go up by 600% and then fall by 80%. We've seen the same volatility in lithium that we saw in uranium. We need a coming together of buyers and sellers so that you maintain price stability for both parties. Maintaining that price stability for both parties will lower the cost of capital to the producing companies if they adopt the same pricing model that's occurring by accident <laughs> in the uranium business. So let's go ahead and look at oil now. Oil's been acting pretty volatile lately as well. We're at $82 at the moment. Yep. Uh, down from the doldrums of the seventy dollars range. So, what's your take on oil? The Biden administration uh, recently talked about how they're planning on filling up the SPR by the end of the year. Um, so, I don't know. You know see what happens there. I, I'm not uh, betting on that one. But uh, what's your take on the oil market? Well, let's work it backwards. Uh, politicians, you know, they're lying when their lips are moving. Uh, if they tell the truth, it's always by accident. Uh, if they do it. Uh, it won't be because, be because they said they were going to do it. So let's leave that out. Uh, the oil industry is a very good business. I've been in it my whole life. Uh, it's how I learned the mining business. I learned lessons in the oil business. I made money in the mining business. Pardon me, in the oil business. I employed both in the mining business. So I've been with it a very long time, and I like it. Let's disclose bias there. Industry pricing has been set by political perception. The big thinkers of the world, the Biden's, the Trudeau's, the Merkel's, <laughs> my favorite energy physicist, what's her name, Greta Thornburg, uh, people like that, will tell you that peak oil demand occurs in 2030 or 2032, which is ridiculous. Now think about on the face of it, how they'll fly 1,200 private jets to Davos to tell you to drive less. Uh, they fly on oil, you know. Peak oil demand occurs in something like 2065 or 2070. So the net present values don't have a six-year tail. They have a 50-year tail. <laughs> Meanwhile, at $70, the industry is insanely profitable. The operating margins are superb. Normally in resources, when the operating margins are this good, what happens is that the, in the industry invests a whole bunch of money to in uh, produce more, which depresses prices. But what's happening in oil is different. The political administration is trying to deny capital to the oil business. So the oil equity prices are unreasonably low at the same time that they're trying to make both insurance and debt unavailable to the industry. The industry, as a consequence, is reducing their sustaining capital investment to the point where they are underinvesting in the underinvesting uh, to the tune of about a billion dollars a day in sustaining capital investments, and most of the industry has halted new project investments. This means that while the demand for oil continues to increase for 45 years, supplies of oil are already decreasing uh, everywhere in the planet with the sole exception of the United States and Canada. So we have a circumstance where perversely uh, the political forces are guaranteeing higher prices for longer. <laughs> The key then is to look for companies that are making sustaining capital investments so they'll continue to generate free cash flow while at the same time being generous with their shareholders with the free cash that they're generating. Look no far further than Exxon Mobil, a 30-year track record for the intelligent deployment of capital, a world leader uh, in refining and marketing, a world leader in exploration. Uh, other than Saudi Aramco, the largest uh, oil company in the world by market capitalization. They aren't merely making sustaining capital investments, which they're doing, more than replacing their production. They bet $60 billion buying Pioneer to increase their production. They also made a series of discoveries offshore Guyana, which total now 11 billion recoverable barrels of oil, a discovery big enough to impact a company the size of Exxon. Meanwhile, they're generating so much cash that despite spending $60 billion for Pioneer, despite sustaining capital investments, and despite uh, a major investment in Guyana, they will increase returns to shareholders via buybacks and dividends by 14% this year. This is a truly virtuous set of circumstances. And the names don't confine themselves to Exxon. 
uh, there's a lot of things out there to do. I just point out Exxon by way of saying that this underpriced virtue doesn't require a journey into the sub 200 million market cap space. <laughs> you can look at the biggest and the best, uh, and they aren't merely cheap. They're stupidly cheap. Why, why do you think that is? Why, why are they so cheap? I think I think a lot of things. I, I think that a lot of money managers these days don't manage their own money. They manage somebody else's money. And so they are inclined to take at face value the values that they get from the, you know, Washington Post or the New York Times or CNBC. In other words, they're getting financial advice from journalists who have no money of their own. Uh, I think, too, the political perception of the oil business is very, very, very bad. President Biden says, on the one hand, you guys need to increase production to bring down gasoline prices, and I'm going to put you out of business in 2030. This is relatively schizophrenic. Uh, investors, too, believe the rhetoric that they hear from the World Economic Forum about the fact that uh, alternative energies uh, will be the death knell of oil. Uh, I like arithmetic, so I'll give you a little. But we have spent now well in excess of $5 trillion over 40 years on alternative energies. And we've reduced the market share of fossil fuels from a high of 82% all the way down to 81% after the expenditure of $5 trillion. I'm not arguing against alternative energies. I've invested in them myself. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that the forecasted demise of the oil industry as a consequence of people in Germany where the sun doesn't shine putting up solar towers is fairly low. Uh, and the outcome of that understanding is if you care uh, about the purchasing power of your savings over time, you have to pay attention to the oil business. Yeah, so speaking of... Uh hydrocarbons. Let's go ahead and shift over to coal. Coal, uh, what's your uh, perception there on coal? Uh, I, I love the coal business. I I mean, I have concerns about the coal business, uh, not just because of carbon, but also because of the generation of uh, particulate pollution. The, the Chinese government has said that 500,000 people a year die in China as a consequence of respiratory ailments from utilization of coal. Meanwhile, demand for coal set an all-time high in 2023, and coal plants are being built like mad around the world. Regardless of my feelings, my concern about particulate pollution, and my concern about carbon, my preference that we didn't put a bunch of more crap in the atmosphere, the reality is that a billion people on Earth have no access to primary electricity. They'd like to live like you and I. And I wonder what right I have to deny them of that. There are another two billion people on Earth who have access to intermittent or unaffordable electricity. They want to live like you and I do too. We've done a wonderful job, which we haven't acknowledged as a, spe as a species, of lifting 1.5 billion people worldwide from the clutches of dire poverty, making them merely poor. There isn't, it isn't like there isn't more to do. There's a lot more to do. The truth is we're gonna do it. Uh, and as we do it, demand for electricity is gonna increase. And whether we like it or not, uh, from a kilowatt hour standpoint, the cheapest form of generating capacity on the planet uh, is coal. When we lecture poorer countries, emerging and frontier market countries, about their duty to reduce carbon, those countries say to us, yes, we should reduce carbon. But we shouldn't reduce it on a per country basis. We should reduce it. We should reduce it on a per capita basis. So India, with 1.2 billion poor people, thinks that carbon consumption in India should be measured against carbon consumption per capita in West Germany and the United States. <laughs> they also point out that it's hypocritical if you're measuring carbon not to take into account historical carbon generation, virtually all of which occurred in the West. If then we were to reduce carbon production uh, rateably, taking into account past production and taking into account per capita current production, that would mean that the price of a kilowatt hour in the United States uh, of electricity, because we had to subsidize 
uh, consumers in other countries would be 40 cents or 50 cents as opposed to 12 cents. In other words, we would have to eat our own cooking. If you explain that value proposition to U.S. taxpayers the way it has been expressed through the market to German taxpayers, I think that the perception around fossil fuels would be very different than the perception that faces us today. But irrespective of perspective, it isn't your perception or mine that matters. It's the perception of the buyers. And the buyers who want to buy electricity are forced as a consequence of cost to buy coal. Gotcha. So before we wrap up this interview, Rick, I know, uh, you know, you've had a lot of experience throughout the years, you know, you're in your late forties, let's say. Uh, but you know, you're the kind of person that I suspect continues to learn. So I, I want to ask you, what are some valuable lessons that you've learned within the last year or so, you know, uh, that you didn't know before? Well, the one that's the most easy to talk about is the fact that I've now graded 80,000 investor portfolios. Anybody who goes to rural investment media and lists their natural resource stocks, I'll rank them for free. I did it to teach. But what happened generating, looking at 80,000 portfolios is I got to learn. I got to learn that most people own way more stocks than they can understand relative to the time that they invest in understanding them. Uh, I learned that despite the fact that to make money in natural resources, you have to be a contrarian, which is to say you have to buy stuff that's out of favor. Most people buy stuff that's in favor, which explains why bull markets go so long and why bear markets go so deep, because the market is irrational. Uh, I've learned, well, rather, it has reinforced in me the lesson that the market isn't a source of information. It's merely a facility for buying and selling fractional ownership and businesses. And if it is a market for information, then that market occurs in exactly the wrong way, which is to say you have to do what the market doesn't <laughs> and don't do what the market does. Uh, you have to buy uranium at $20, not at 100 but most people do uh, the exact opposite. Uh, a couple refreshing lessons. I've joined the board of a student libertarian organization called Students for Liberty. And when I moan about the mashup that my generation is doing to the world, when I hang out with 160,000 young kids worldwide uh, talking about von Mises and Hayek, I turn into a raging bull. There's that many of <laughs> I mean, us? Yeah. We had 160,000 <laughs> wow. kids at our events last year. We have 3,000 volunteer students, co student coordinators there. I mean, it's really a remarkable organization. When you get to hang out with these kids – you think, you know what, if the, if the future's in the hands of these kids, the future's actually in pretty good hands. I come away from that being just wildly, crazily uh, optimistic, which is great. You know, by background, I'm a lender, and lenders are seldom raging optimists. Um, so that's good. Uh, and I've <clears throat> learned, too, that there's sort of a subculture of investors out there, many of whom mercifully – inhabit the rural classroom and rural investment media who are actually in invested in their own education, uh, who care a lot less uh, about what popular media and popular culture thinks uh, and care a lot more about educating themselves uh, and a lot more about ar arithmetic and common sense and in investing. I think that there's a, a, a subculture of investors that are coming into the market that is remarkably similar to that wonderful subculture of investors that entered the market in the early part of the decade of the 1980s or in the 1950s. Uh, a, a group of investors with a cultural predisposition uh, to value and education. Uh, I think back to the lessons that my mentor, Peter Kundal, taught me. Uh, he learned those lessons from Ben Graham. Uh, and I think that you're seeing a, a return in um, – value, and I don't mean value as an investment topic, but uh, you're seeing a, a, a return to real hardcore securities analysis, uh, which I think is useful. And I see that the tools available to a securities analyst today through technology are remarkably better. I used to have to paw through the pink sheets manually and look for market makers that were value-oriented to find myself companies to research. 
I can now go on to Bloomberg and I can type in cash flow positive negative enterprise value, which means companies that are generating cash where their current assets are worth more than their market capitalization, their current liabilities. And I can get back a list of every public company in the world <laughs> that qualifies as a Ben Graham company. And I can get that in two minutes for $2,000 a month. Uh, that same exercise when I was a student would have consumed my entire year, literally my entire year. And I can accomplish that now for $2,000 a month in two minutes. This conjunction uh, of a new subculture that's looking at things the way they are, as opposed to the way the big thinkers tell you that you ought to be, overlaid with the technological tools available to us, uh, means that there will be a class of investor emerging right now that will be active for the next 20 or 30 years that will be wildly more successful than their predecessors, including myself, were. Yeah, it's the pendulum swinging the other way because naturally the younger demographics want to stray away from what's what their parents do, what their parents think. And, you know, that's been kind of like this... Um, this left wing progressive pr progressiveness has become so ubiquitous that it's kind of become uncool at this point. So it, it, it makes sense to me that, you know, there's these subcultures starting to sprout out in response to that because it's part of the natural inclination of, you know, coming of age and, and growing older. You know, this, this woke thing that you mentioned, uh, I, among other things, mentor a young African American group of <laughs> mostly ex offenders. Uh, and I remember uh, asking the young black guy who introduced them to me, I said, well, you know, I'm nervous about an old, fat, bald, white guy talking to this group. Um, he said, well, don't be. If they show up, they assume you have value. I said, okay. Uh, how do I address them? He said, well, start in English, okay? I mean, <laughs> you're throwing up all kinds of barriers to communication that doesn't exist. These guys want to talk to you. They want to know about how to get ahead. Uh, don't assume. Uh, don't don't buy into this woke assumption. Don't assume that people necessarily need to be segregated each other from each other by sex, by sex preference, by color, by religion, by anything. Uh, all of this, it turns out, is mostly BS. Uh, most of the people in the world are pretty good people. It's just that the bad people make so much noise, you know? Um, and I, I really think that's receding. I had a, another case very recently at the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada where I spent a lot of time with what they call First Nations and we call Indians, which is to say indigenous or aboriginal peoples. And what I found was that some of the, if you will, professional indigenous people uh, had all this woke trapping. When I talked to the traditional chiefs, when I talked to the people who were responsible for the well-beings of these people, they didn't want to hear about any of that. They wanted to hear about how they could affect economic advancement for young people uh, in their groups. They wanted to hear about how they could eradicate poverty. They didn't want their grandchildren to be stuck on trap lines uh, harvesting muskrat at 20 degrees below like they were. There was absolutely none of this woke garbage. Uh, it's these are the assets we have. This is the help we need. This is what we think you can get out of it. This is what we need out of it. Can we make a deal? It was really refreshing. <laughs> yeah, it, it really paints home the picture that we kind of live in a simulacrum, like this kind of false reality that's been presented to us on the media, but then you actually inter interface with people in the real world. I highly seldom come across anyone that'll be classified as woke, like when I go out. Yep. And I live in a very, I'm, I'm not in the middle of nowhere. I live in a very populous location. So... It, it kind of brings home to your point there that people essentially at the end of the day, they just want to, they want to grow and they're not as, um, I guess, sensitive to all the junk that the media throws at us as we might think. I know you have your, uh, Rick, before you sign off, I just want to let you put in some closing statements. And I know you have your symposium, uh, coming, not your symposium. Yeah. Your symposium coming up on the yeah. 7th of July. 
through yep. the 11th. I want to give you a chance to also uh, talk about that for a second before we sign off. Really three things I want to talk about. One, Rural Investment Media. Go to ruralinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource stocks, and I personally will rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. I'll add comments to issues that I think my comments might be worth something about. Once you've done that, go over to the Rural Classroom. We have 200 hours of instructional programming there. Uh, invest in yourself. Learn how to analyze natural resource stocks. Do not use the technique, got a hunch, bet a bunch. It won't work. Uh, Rural Classroom is free. There is weekly question and answer session conducted by myself for free, which is a really good price. Uh, not for free, of course, is the Rural Symposium. We've been doing it for about 30 years. Simply put, I think this is the best natural resources investment symposium on the planet. We've stood the test of time. We have great big picture thinkers. We have great analysts, not guys, by the way, who, fi who failed as utility analysts or supermarket analysts, but people who've been in the natural resource business for 30 years. Importantly, we have the living legends, uh, people who have built multi-billion dollar natural resource companies from scratch telling you how they did it and telling you what they're investing in today. Uh, whether you attend live, which is what I would prefer, uh, July 7th through 11th in Boca Raton, Florida, or at home via live stream, you'll have access for a year to the recordings of the conference. And you'll need a year to understand all the information that we give you in the four days that you have to attend. Importantly, whether you attend in person or via live stream, the tuition that we charge you is 100% gold-plated refundable. If you don't think that we have delivered curriculum value relative to uh, the price you paid to absorb it, we'll give you the money back. Uh, as I say, the time risk is yours, but the financial risk is all mine. Uh, I look forward, irrespective to whether you uh, it, attend personally, which I would prefer, uh, or virtually. And the reason I say uh, prefer live is there's a lot of communication that doesn't take place in a formal way that can be taped. But watching uh, uh, somebody like Robert Friedland, who's built billions of dollars of shareholder value, walk around the exhibit floor and see what booths he talks to, listens to the questions that he asks, uh, having the ability to join an informal conversation with Jim Rickards or Daniela DiMartino Booth uh, in the bar and find out what working for Goldman Sachs was really like, <laughs> that kind of stuff I can't duplicate on tape. I just can't do it. Um, yeah, so whether you attend it, with it. Yeah, it, it's just it's just an incredible experience. And as I say, it comes with an absolute gold-plated money-back guarantee. Fantastic. So you heard it there, folks. You got the Rick Roll Symposium on the 7th to the 11th of July. But then before that, you've got the boot camp, April 20th. So link to both of those is down below. Check them out. Highly recommend it. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed this content, be sure to give it a like. Comment down below. Let me know what you think. And subscribe to the channel for more content like this. And with that said, you all, I will see you in the next episode. Bye, y'all.